Hey folks, and welcome to lecture three of advanced linear algebra. Today we're gonna to be talking about spans and linear combinations. We'll get to independence in lecture four. All right, so both of these concepts are direct generalizations of things that you should have seen in regular linear algebra, which were also just called linear combinations and spans, okay? The idea behind a linear combination is, well, you start off with some fixed set of vectors in your vector space, okay? So these v1, v2, up to vk, those are sort of fixed and given to you ahead of time. And then, well, any vector that you can construct that's in this form, any vector that you can construct out of your two basic uh, vector space operations, which are scalar multiplication and vector addition, any vector of that form is called a linear combination of the starting vectors, v1 up to vk. Okay, and the idea here, when you learned about this concept back in introductory linear algebra, where V must have been Rn, um, the idea was there, I mean, maybe you had one vector there, then the linear combinations were just all vectors on the line in the direction of that vector. If you had two vectors, then the linear combinations of those two vectors were, were just everything on the plane containing those two vectors. And similarly for higher dimensional spaces, if you have three vectors, um, then maybe your span is like a three dimensional hyperplane in, in whatever higher dimensional space you're working with and so on, okay? And the idea is sort of the same uh, in arbitrary vector spaces. Linear combinations, they're just sort of things that you can build out of the starting vectors using your allowed vector space operations. All right. But of course, I mean, we're not just an RNA anymore. We can work with polynomials or functions or matrices and so on. So let's go through a couple examples of seeing things that are and are not linear combinations of other vectors where vector can be slightly more exotic than just list of numbers. All right. So uh, as our first example is this polynomial 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. Is that a linear combination of x squared plus 2 and x plus 3? And it's just understood here that we're working in the vector space P2 of polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2. OK, so when I ask, is this a linear combination of these? Really, what I'm asking mathematically is, do there exist scalars such that this is some scalar times the first vector plus some scalar times the second vector. Can I write this guy as a linear combination of these two guys over here? All right, so that's sort of the basic setup in any vector space. It's just does thing equal scalar times first thing plus scalar times second thing and so on down the line, All right? And the way that you solve this when you've just got polynomials is, well, does this, is there, there a way to make these equal to each other? Just match up powers of x, okay? So say, well, if these two sides are equal to each other, then certainly the coefficients, coefficients of x squared have to be equal to each other, for example. So three has to equal c1, and then I don't get any term here because there's no x squared on the second term here. So it's just three equals c1. So looking at the x squared coefficient, I get this equation here, c1 must equal three. Now, if I look at the coefficient of x next, then I find that, hey, the coefficient over on this side is 2. The coefficient of x over on this side is, well, I don't get anything from this term, and then I just get a c2 from this term over here. All right, so I get the equation 2 equals c2 when I look at the x coefficient. And then if I just look at the constant coefficient on both sides, I see that 1 equals, well, I get 2c1 plus 3c2 over here. Those are all the terms that don't have any x's in them. So I get 1 equals... 2c1 plus 3c2. And that, so overall, like once I look at those three different powers of x, I get a system of linear equations. I have three equations and I have two unknowns. The unknowns are the c1 and c2 scalars I'm trying to find. Okay, and this is a linear system with no solutions. You can just check that directly. c1 is 3, c2 is 2. If you plug it in over here, well, this right hand side then, taking these values up here, is not equal to 1. Okay, so that linear system has no solution. So no, this vector here that we started with, that polynomial, is not a linear combination of these two over here. There's no way to choose scalars so that this equals first scalar times this plus second scalar times that. All right, let's do another example. Okay, so that's how it works for polynomials. Let's look at matrices. Okay, so the basic setup is going to be the same, but sort of the details of the calculation are going to be slightly different. All right. But so matrices, they form a vector space, so we can talk about linear combinations in them. And the question now is, is this matrix here, one, two, three, four, a linear combination of these two matrices here? So again, what this is asking is, do there exist scalars such that this thing is one scalar times this plus another scalar times this, all right? And that's all we're saying here, okay? Does there exist C1 and C2 such that this equation holds? 
And again, the way to figure out an answer to this is just sort of look at each of the individual components or pieces and match them up on the left and right hand sides. Turn it into a system of equations because we know how to solve systems of equations. We learned that in the first linear algebra course. If you look at the top left entries of these matrices, you got a one up here. So one has got to equal whatever the top left entry is on the right hand side. Well, top left entry on the right hand side is C1 plus C2. Right, so that's where this equation comes from. One equals C1 plus C2. If you look at the top right entries, well, on the left hand side, it's two. On the right hand side, it's C1 times one, which is just C1, plus zero times C2, which is not there. So you just get two equals C1. That's your next equation. And similarly, if you look at the bottom left corner and bottom right corner, you get two more equations. So you get four equations overall. And again, we have two unknowns. We have two variables, C1 and C2, okay? And then we just go through our usual procedure from introductory linear algebra for solving this linear system. And it's going to turn out that this time, yeah, there is a solution. We can sort of see part of the solution just right from this top right entry. C1's got equal 2, and you plug that into the other equations, and you find out that, hey, C2 equals minus 1 also works. Um, and then once you have those, it's just a matter of checking that all four equations are satisfied. Them. But So yeah, there is a solution in this case. So yes, this matrix is a linear combination of these guys. In particular, we know even what the linear combination is. It's 2 times this matrix minus one times that matrix. Okay, so that's a linear combination that works. So yeah, that, that matrix is a linear combination of the other two. All right, and sort of building naturally off of linear combinations are spans, okay? And the span, just stated in words, is the span of a set of vectors, it's the set of all linear combinations of those vectors. Okay, so it's just, you take all possible linear combinations and you throw them together in a set. All right, so again, if we go back to Rn, where we've already learned about these things in introductory linear algebra, in Rn, um, when we took a span, uh, the span of a single vector was the line in the direction of that vector going through the origin, right? All linear combinations of one vector are just the scalar multiples of that vector. So it's just the line in that direction. If you had two vectors that were, you know, not parallel to each other, not pointing in the same direction, um, then the span of them, again, it's all linear combinations, it's just the plane containing those two vectors, okay? And I mean, in general, the span of a set of vectors, it's just sort of the smallest hyperplane containing all of those vectors. We'll talk about this more a little bit later, okay? So that's all the span is. I mean, the technical definition is kind of ugly there just because we want to be a little bit careful here for one technical reason that I'll come back to a bit later. We want to be a little bit careful. Linear combinations are always finite, so I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's sort of baked into the, the definition here. I'll come back to that. All right, for now, let's go through through another example. Let's show uh, that the polynomials 1, x, and x squared, let's show that they span P2, which again, remember, it's the set of polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2, which we showed as a vector space last lecture. Okay, so how do we show that that spans P2? Well, it, it almost comes from directly from the definition, actually. Okay, if you think about what P2 is, it's the set of all polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2, in other words, it's a set of all functions of this form. It's a set of all functions that can be written as some scalar plus some scalar times x plus some scalar times x squared. All right, that's what P2 is, just by definition. But these things here, I mean, these are, again, just by definition, these are in this span over here. Because what is the span? It's the set of linear combinations. And what does a linear combination of 1x and x squared look like? Well, it looks like this. It's some scalar times this first guy plus some scalar times the second guy, plus some scalar times this third guy. So yeah, everything in P2 can be written as some linear combination of these guys. So yeah, everything in here is in the span. And that's what we wanted to show. Okay, and of course, there's nothing special about the two here. Uh, more generally, um, the set of less than or equal to, uh, degree less than or equal to P polynomials is, well, it's exactly the span of one X, X squared up to X to the power P. And again, that just follows almost directly from definition. So there's not much to do there. All right, so great. We understand polynomials. Well, if we go a little bit further, what if what if we look at the span of the set of all, uh, all of these monomials, 1x, x squared, x cubed, x to the power 4, x to the power 5, and so on. It's okay to talk about the span of an infinite collection of vectors. So it's okay to do this. We can talk about the span of this set here. And the question is, is the function e to the power x, is it in that span, okay? And the reason that I'm posting this example here is because 
you might be inclined to think that yes, it is at first if you've seen Taylor series before. Okay, recall from calculus or wherever you learned about Taylor series that e to the power x, you can write that as an infinite sum like this. You can write it as sum n equals zero up to infinity of x to the power n over n factorial. Okay, so this is Taylor series for e to the x centered at zero. And certainly this looks like, hey, this is some scalar times one plus some scalar times x plus some scalar times x squared plus some scalar times x cubed and so on. So yeah, it looks like it's a linear combination of the things in this set, but it turns out it's not. And the reason for this comes back to, uh, to what I talked about up here about finiteness. Okay, linear combinations by definition are finite. And so spans only take finite sums, only finite linear combinations. You can't have an infinity up here. K okay? has to be a natural number. Okay. And so th this expression that we've written down below for e to the x, yeah, it's true. Like that, that's, that's one way of writing e to the power x, but that's this over here, this is not a linear combination. So it does not show that x e to the, the power x is in the span of that set there. You would need a finite sum for it to be in that span. Okay. Maybe j just sort of the reason that we require these linear combinations to be finite is because if we allowed infinite sums here, you get into some really murky territory that's beyond the scope of this course. All of a sudden you have to deal with convergence issues and so on, which I mean, maybe you know how to deal with when we're working with, with real numbers, but what about when we're working over other fields or in infinite dimensional vector spaces or all sorts of weird settings that you haven't encountered before? We don't want to get into that. Okay, so we don't want to have to deal with convergence issues, so we stick to finite. All right. Anyway, so let's go back to this e to the power x example here. Okay, so so this Taylor series does not show that e to the power x is in the span of the set up here. Maybe maybe there's some other way of showing that it is in that span though. Okay, so we still have to rule that out. We still haven't actually shown that e to the x is not in that span. So the way that you can see that's not in that span is well, if it were in that span then e to the x would be a polynomial, right? It would be some finite sum of terms like that. So it would be a polynomial, but the derivative of any polynomial, if you take its derivative over and over and over and over again, eventually you get the zero function, right? Because when you take its derivative, it goes down by one. Okay, so take its derivative over and over and over again, you get the zero function. But if you take the derivative of e to the power x over and over and over again, you never get the zero function, okay? So no, it's not a polynomial, so it's not in that span. Okay. All right, one more example, sort of a, um, no, no, two more examples, sorry. All right, so let, let's go to a matrix example here. All right, so um, let's show that M2 is spanned by these four matrices here. So remember M2, that's a set of two by two matrices. And these four matrices here, I'm defining them for the first time right now. What these are, E sub IJ, it's the matrix that has a one in the IJ entry and zeros everywhere else. So for example, E11, that has a one in the one one entry and zeros everywhere else. So I, I've written it down explicitly over here. That's E11. E12 of that has a one in the one two entry. So first row, second column and zeros everywhere else. So that's E12. E21, now the one is down in the, the second row, first column and E22, it's down in the second row, second column. All right, so let's show that every matrix can be written as a linear combination of these four matrices, right? Because that's what this means. That's what it means for M2 to be spanned by those four matrices. All right, and the way that you do it is just sort of very naively. We want to write an arbitrary matrix A, B, C, D as a linear combination of those four matrices. Well, you can just sort of peel the matrix apart in a sense. You can just write, as, if I want to get an A in the top left entry, I just do A times E11, and that'll get me the A in the top left. If I want to get a B in the top right, I do B times E12. That gets me the B in the top right. And similarly for C and D, each of these matrices here, each of these EIJs, they sort of correspond to one entry in a matrix, All right? So that works for E22, and I mean, sort of should be fairly believable that more generally in M, M, N, okay, so the set of M by N matrices, it turns out that's spanned by the M, N different matrices, E11, E12, up to E, M, N, right? There, there are M, N different choices for what these subscripts are down here gonna be, corresponding to the M, N different choices for where the single one goes in that matrix. Okay, and these, these matrices are called the standard matrix units. And we're gonna see them popping up over and over again later on in this course. All righty. And let's maybe go through just one sort of less trivial example where there's actually some calculation that has to go on here. So let's determine whether or not some polynomial is in the span of two other polynomials. And again, spans, they're just linear combinations. It's a set of all linear combinations. So this is just a different way of wording the question. So determine whether or not this 
polynomial is a linear combination of these two polynomials. That's an exactly equivalent question. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, same way that we did earlier in this lecture. Uh, we want to determine whether or not there's C1 and C2 such that polynomial equals C1 times polynomial plus C2 times polynomial. And now we just set it up as a linear system just like we did in an earlier example, right? Match up powers of x squared, okay? Well, we have 1x squared equals C1 plus 2C2 x squared. How many x's? Well, minus 3 equals minus C1 minus 3C2. That's my second equation. And similarly, constant term gives you a third equation. Turns out this linear system has a solution. You just go through Gaussian elimination and find it. This time it's going to be C1 is minus 3, C2 equals 2. Okay, so because this linear system has a solution, what that tells us is that R is a linear combination of P and Q. So in other words, R is in the span of P and Q. Okay, we don't actually even really care what the solution is. It doesn't matter that C1 is minus 3 versus minus 7. All that matters is that there is a solution that tells us that, yeah, it is in the span. Okay, and in particular, the linear combination that shows it's in the span is this one here. That comes from those coefficients. Okay. Now, sort of the main reason that we're interested in linear combinations and spans is they give us possibly the simplest way of constructing subspaces, okay? So this is our sort of first theorem uh, about spans and linear combinations. And what it says is that if you're working in any vector space and you have any subset of that vector space, so B here does not have to be a subspace. B is just any set, okay, that's contained within V. It does not have to be a subspace, just a subset then the span of B, well, it turns out that is a subset, uh, sorry, a subspace of V, okay? So starting off with any subset, you take its span, you get a subspace, okay? So taking the span, in some sense, it gives you more structure. It makes it, it turns anything into a subspace or a vector space. It makes it just work better for linear algebra. Okay, so our next goal is let's prove this theorem. Unfortunately, nothing too crazy yet. Everything's just gonna follow fairly quickly from the definitions, but let's go through the procedure. So the way that we're gonna prove this theorem, the way that we're gonna show that something is a subspace is we're gonna leech off of that theorem that we saw last class. We're gonna leech off of theorem 1.1. So I'm gonna scroll back really quickly just to remind you of that theorem. All right, so theorem 1.1, this is our main way for determining whether or not a set is a subspace. You have to check these two conditions, closure under vector addition and closure under scalar multiplication. So let's do those, okay? So let's, sorry about all the jumping here. All right, there we go, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. All right, so if we wanna show that something is a subspace, we wanna show that span of B is a subspace, we have to show those two properties. So let's start off, let's show closure under vector addition. Let's show if I, that if I take two things in the span of B and add them up, I'm still in the span of, v, span of B, all right? So that's the goal here, take two things in the span of B. Well, what's that mean, okay? If these are in the span of B, that means that I can write V as a linear combination of things in B, and I can also write W as a linear combination of things in B, okay? So in other words, there exist scalars, C1 up to CK, such that V equals this linear combination of things in B, and there also exists scalars d1 up to dk such that w equals this linear combination of things in B, okay? So v1 up to vk, those are just some members of B. It doesn't matter what they are, okay? So because v and w are in the span, then I can do that. I can write the linear combination. I can write them both as a linear combination. And now I just add them up. I want the sum to also be in the span of B. So I add them up, v plus w, well, what's that equal? Well. It equals C1, V1, plus D1, V1, and I just sort of factor the scalars out in front. I'm going to get C1 plus D1 times V1, all right? And I also get a C2, V2 plus a D2, V2, and again, factor the scalars out. I'm going to get C2 plus D2 times V2, and so on down the line. If I add the linear combinations for V and W up, I get this linear combination for V plus W. And because this is a linear combination of things in B, again, remember V1, V2, and VK, those are all in B, then great this thing must be in the span of B because it's a linear combination of things in B. All right, so that's all there is to it. It's just taking the two individual linear combinations, you add them up, eh, still a linear combination. Part B, we have to show um, that if I take a vector that's in the span of B and I multiply by a scalar, then it's still in the span of B. Okay, and that's actually, it's very similar to part A, so we're not gonna bother going through it. The idea is the exact same, just write V as a linear combination of things from B Multiply by a scalar, well, it's still a linear combination of things from B, okay? So nothing too fancy happens there. All right, 
So that does it for today's class, and I will see you next time uh, to talk about linear dependence and independence.